All righty. So Audra and I had the opportunity a couple weeks ago to look at uh, what we wanted to accomplish with these small business happy hours uh, coming through the end of summer. And one of the things we realized is that small businesses needed to start making decisions to get them through the summer months and the coming six weeks, but we also needed to start planning out for what is gonna happen six months from now. And so we kind of looked at these, these small business decision-making uh, for now and the future. And one area that we've identified uh, as having a big impact and it stretches to all different facets of your small business is this concept of inventory. So we, we started diving into what this means and we, we found some interesting statistics out there. So first let's just talk about the retail industry and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get into our, our guests here today. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed with, in, with inventory and retail is that uh, things are sitting on the shelves, right? People are not coming into stores. Even if you've made the switch to online or e-commerce, things aren't moving as quickly as they once did. So as a result, discounts, right? Offering those sales, offering those discounts to move product is, has been one of the decisions that small businesses have had. Now, that helps definitely in the short term. We, we clear some inventory, we get that cash on hand, but once you start offering discounts, once you start offering sales, your cash flow goes down dramatically. And the number that was actually presented was discounts were at about 18% of normal. So you can already see we're losing almost 20% of, the, of uh, the, the, the sales numbers coming in. So what happens then? We have less cash flow. Maybe we can't bring people back to work as soon as, as we thought we could. When you start projecting out for decisions when it comes to financial flexibility, financial stability, it gets a little bit more difficult because we don't have that cash. And when you look at it, there's a supply and the demand side to this. What's happening with, with our suppliers? Are they able to meet the demands that we have? And on the flip side of that, maybe our customers' buying habits are just changing at this point in time. Uh, so when you look at how inventory, those, those little decisions uh, that sometimes we take for granted uh, in, in a usual or normal business environment, what are we going to do as we, as we spin this forward uh, to this new normal and how does inventory impact our decision making? So I wanted to introduce our two guests that we have on today. We have Kurt Maurer uh, from Coolant Control. Is that right, Kurt? Yes. Wonderful. And we have uh, Michael Cow from IC3D here in Columbus. Uh, so Kurt, if, if you wouldn't mind, just uh, uh, do an EEC introduction for us. Tell us a little bit about cooling control and uh, we'll, we'll start today off with a bang. All right. So cooling control is a manufacturer of specialty lubricants um, where we our primary focus is on the metalworking industry. So we're manufacturing cutting fluids, drawing and stamping compounds, cleaners, rust preventatives, and other related products. Um, we're located in Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, actually specifically in St. Bernard next to Ivorydale. I don't know if you're familiar with that area. Uh, we've been in business since really the mid 70s. Um, and then we took over in 2006 is when I kind of bought Vulcan oil. And then we turned it into coolant control. I don't know, what else should I say? I think that's great. Thank you, okay, Kurt. Good. Michael, what do you think? Hi, my name is Michael Cow. I run a company called IC3D Printers uh, here in Columbus, Ohio. I started this in 2012 while I was still working in the automotive industry. But uh, so things didn't really take off or get serious until about 2016. So about four years old. Um, we serve mainly the manufacturing um, sector. And, and a lot of automotive companies, but also getting into, also uh, serving various industries like architecture and medical and aerospace. Um, and uh, yeah, so we do, half of our business is 3D printing as a service. So literally um, printing things of a customer's design or getting there, helping them design something and printing that. And the other half is manufacturing consumables to feed uh, 3D printers. 
Great. And so as manufacturers, clearly inventory is a really big part of um, what you do. Talk a little bit about the types of inventory that you keep on hand and talk a little bit about what your supply chain looks like for your inventory. Michael? Okay. Yeah, sure. So um, in the two halves of the business, uh, it's quite different. So on the simpler half, it's we're manufacturing consumables. It's a, a filament. It comes in different materials, different additives to that, different spool sizes. The, the stuff looks like weed whacker line, and so it comes on different size spools. And so um, it's, it's uh, the tricky part in balancing that for us is to understand, you know, which combination of all that um, is, you know, what the demand is for the different variations, right? Um, so it's, uh, yeah, so it's raw materials, looks like plastic pellets, little beads um, mm -hmm. for the most part, spools, and then you have all your packaging stuff, bags and boxes and labels and stuff. Um, on the printing service side, the consumables there are pretty much the filament, right? Whether it's the filament that we produce in-house or we buy filament from other companies if it's a specialty stuff that we don't make. So it's managing that. Um, there's also a lot of uh, consumables that the, that the equipment needs. And so it's, it's also managing that, um, not necessarily stuff going out to customers. Um, and then soon we're getting into uh, manufacturing our own 3D printer. So then there's another, you know, grouping of inventory that we'll have to deal with, figure out a system for. And, and I guess I'll, I'll say that, you know, one system that you use might not be appropriate for, you know, everything you do. Got it. All right. Kurt? There we go. Unmute. Okay. So, um, Manufacturing metalworking fluids and various chemicals. Um, our main inventory items are, you know, we have raw materials and finished goods. So we're stocking a lot of finished goods as well. Uh, in our raw material range, it's, it's anything from oils to chemicals. We have packaging as far as drums, pails, totes, bottles, gallons, boxes, you name it, caps, all kinds of crap. Um, and then for the finished goods, um, it's a wide variety. Um, we store those in bulk. We also have them again, and they're already packaged in pails or drums or totes and one gallon bottles. Um, forgot the first part of your question though. So really just what are the types of inventories oh, okay. that you, so, yeah. you have? So that's basically what they are. So they're 55 gallon drums, 330 gallon totes. We ship things out of here in bulk, like you know, anywhere from 3,000 to 6,000 gallons at a time. And that's our typical inventory. So. So in terms of planning for your inventory from a manufacturing perspective, talk about what it looked like before the pandemic and then what's happened since then in your particular sector. You go, Michael? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, there are, I guess there are three, three different areas that caused um, change in how we would set minimum levels, like threshold levels for stock. Um, you know, the, the one is, uh, you know, the, your sales data, your sales demand changes, you know, because of this, this pandemic. Um, the second area is if a, maybe a vendor um, changes their lead time. And so you have to keep, you have to bump up your thresholds and, and, and have a larger buffer. Um, and then uh, what was the third? Yeah, there's a, there was a third one in there somewhere. I mentioned yesterday, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, I, I guess if you're, if you're creating another product too, um, that would shift things around. So it's the, uh, monitoring of the thresholds and, and, and limits alerts is always like a constant game. You know, maybe you review it, uh, once a week or once a month, depending on what's appropriate. And the whole purpose is just to balance out, you know, cash flow and, uh, yeah, having st having too much stuff on the on the stock, not making money, not turning over, and so forth. So, were you having trouble actually getting inventory? Did that delay your own lead times in terms of um, your own and working with your own customers for your deliverables? Yeah, definitely. So it was kind of interesting. Um, one of the materials that we make for three D printing is P was called 
PETG. Um, and turns out that is a very common material for face shields. So for PPE and a lot of the clear sneeze guards that you see out there now, plastic sneeze guards, a lot of that is actually PETG also. So you can kind of see where this is going, right? We had, we, we now had two difficulties. One is in getting the raw material for our normal product, right? Two, we, very early on, we pivoted to producing face shields, right? So I was spending a lot of time building, um, building the supply chain for this whole new material. And again, trying to source uh, PTG sheet, like clear film, clear sheet for this other product. Yeah. So you really had to plan for multiple. I mean, you had to plan for the PTG when you pivoted in a product that you didn't even really know what the demand was going to look like, right? Yeah. So we're, you know, we're, no, we're ordering as normal, expecting our normal lead times, which is normally very quick, like two days, right? Two, three days, you know, LTL freight ships pallets to our door um, to, to uh, you know, our, our normal demand for filament kind of doubled during COVID because people were, 3D printing, you know, the, the whole 3D printing PPE, you know, face shields and masks, that kind of took off. So, so we were consuming more in-house in our printing service, but also people are, the 3D printing community was demanding more material from us. Got it. Yeah. So, so, so needing more, more than normal, plus having a longer lead time that we had to deal with. So I just want to stay with you and Michael uh, really quick and then Kurt, I want to, we want to go to you, but I, tell us what that did to your working capital, your cash flow. How did you, how were you managing that um, with all these kind of variables that seem to be constantly changing for you? Yeah, sure. So early on, it was very, it was, it was definitely difficult. I mean, we're a small business. Um, we, you know, we don't have a ton of cash sitting around. We have lines of credit. So we definitely, all, you know, almost max those out, let's say. Um, some groups were ordering uh, very large amounts and we would just have to get pretty aggressive on terms, right? Um, mm -hmm. Full payment prior to shipping and ha or half up front or whatever, right? Um, so, so yeah, that was, there was, there were definitely risks uh, that had to be taken and just calls made. It's like, do we do this or not, right? Do we, do you, do you pull the trigger on this and, and eat whatever interest or, take on whatever buffer um yeah especially with the building the new supply chain for this new product which again was face shields um you know again they're getting bombarded by a bunch of people ordering the same things elastic bands plastic sheeting raw material little foam pads or whatever and so they're so you just have to you just have to gamble a little bit Mm -hmm. and send uncomfortably uh, sized POs, for example. Yeah. So, uh, Kurt, I, I want to change, I wanna, same topic, but I want to approach it from a different angle. Uh, sure. when, when we had our, our pre-meeting for this a couple of days ago, uh, you mentioned that you potentially had, was it 500 different products or? Yeah, we, we manufactured over 177 different products last year. Um, that could be sold under like over 500 packaging or labels. You know, okay. some products we make, we sell under different names, but they're definitely all sold under different packaging items. Okay. So w w when we start looking uh, from a, a magnitude of just, of just product, the, the sheer size and number and variability, uh, what you're talking about, you, you mentioned MRP and ERP being really critical to, to keeping your business functions running smoothly. I, yes. I wondered if you could speak to that a little bit. Oh yeah. So um, we do everything through MRP. I mean, all of our, we, we base it on finished good demand. And prior to the, uh, the pandemic, it was a really, it was a difficult task, but it was a fun task because you could really look at your historical sales and, and really gauge what your future is gonna be. And you could factor in new customers and trials that you're running to 
meet your, your demand and it all filters down into what raw materials you need to buy, what packaging you need to get, everything. And um, we would review that probably every quarter, sometimes um, a little more frequently on certain items. But man, when the pandemic hit, most of our sales are in automotive. And with them shutting down, everything just plummeted. So we really had to then look at those levels again. And as people started buying, what were they going to be buying? And it became a lot more of talking with your customers on when they're going to start up, what their demand might be. And they didn't know anything either. So initially it was a guess game of what are we going to make? How are we going to store it? Um, and what it's turned out to be looking at what we're selling now and how we're managing all this is um, people are buying less, they're buying smaller volumes or they're buying smaller packaging than they were. So when we were storing lots of drums of a finished product, now we're storing more pails of it because they're just buying smaller volumes and using a lot less. Um, and basically through the MRP, we're able to balance that, but it has to be reviewed constantly. Um, right now we review it probably every two weeks because it's changing that frequently. It's changing that fast for us. Um, sales are slowly bringing, going up, but people are still buying smaller packaging of those items. Um, so it's, it's been a little tricky in that regard to maintain it. Um, but by reviewing it and making sure you have accurate data, um, you, we were able to balance it out. I mean, we, we have a nice flow of raw materials coming in. Um, you know, some other changes that we had to make were in how we buy. Uh, we were buying things for, you know, a month or two of production we'd order it ahead and it would all start coming in and we'd warehouse it. Um, now we're buying things in smaller lots. We've worked out arrangements with our suppliers uh, where they're stocking material for us and we order smaller batches at a time. And, and the benefit we've received from that has been tremendous as far as, and something we should have done a long time ago. We were just kind of fat, dumb and happy, I think. Um, because by buying less at a time and buying it more spaced out, it really helps with your cash flow. You know, I don't have, I have 30 day terms with most of these companies. And so if I buy it all on first of the month, I owe it all at the end of the month. Whereas if I'm buying it two weeks, it's really spacing out those terms in a way. So I'm letting them carry the, the inventory, whereas I'm just buying it when I need it. So that's, those have been some changes we've had to make to our, our philosophy and our production. And then in addition, we've streamlined our processes um, to meet that. We've had more people kind of off topic now, sorry. Um, we, we did have people who were multiple touches on a product, you know, order it, it would be received, information would go to the laboratory, it'd be approved, information would go back to the warehouse so we could slot it and put labels on it, and then information would go back to purchasing so they could officially receive it. And, and we streamlined all that to where basically the dock operator does it all now. And I, I don't think you're off topic at all. Oh, okay. Right. I, I mean, I, I think that's a very important part of, of what we're recognizing in today's day and age, right? That that little changes touch every other part, part of your business. Um, and I would just point out that you started with the demand side of the business, right? What, what are your customers buying habits, uh, especially now that they've changed? You then moved to the supplier side and said, OK, how can I get better terms? from the, the raw materials coming in. And then it, uh, everything we do is a, is a, is a people game, right? It, it's the people who are working and running your business for you on, on a day to day. So I don't think you were off base at, or, or went off on a tangent at all. Good. Or, um, we go also ahead. had to reduce our workforce a little bit. So that also forces to streamline things more and it's, it, it has paid off. I mean, it's been, I mean, as far as our raw material inventories, they're more accurate. Uh, the guy who's in charge of it wanted to take on more responsibility, and he has been tremendous in his job, you know, getting it done and, and keeping everything slotted where it needs to go so that when we do our, um, basically we just do like mini inventory checks, you know, cycle counts periodically. And sometimes they're off, especially on totes and drums, because we use them or they have holes in them apparently, and then they go back to the supplier. No one told us that stuff. So, so we'd have an inventory of totes that was off by like 30 totes after the course of like a couple months. And it was, it was ridiculous. So that stuff has all been really has been corrected because of this. So the pandemic has helped us a little bit, but it's been a pain in the butt. 
so let's uh, let's wrap up this question uh, by bringing it back to cash flow. You you said that you believe your cash flow has improved because you've been able to, to order in smaller space out payments. Any other realizations that, that you've come to or uh, things that you're not going to go back to uh, in the future when it comes to realizing cash? Um, yeah, we're not going to go back to buying larger volumes of inventory. Now that we've worked out deals with these suppliers, uh, many of the larger suppliers that we have, um, we're going to continue to buy just in time with them stocking larger volumes so that we know we have it available. And, and that was another issue that we had was um, we're finding more suppliers. You know, we, we, we typically have some products are, are specialty made for us. And so we just have one potential supplier, but other things are commodities and we've always bought from a single company, but with supply issues, we've had um, like some of the raw materials we buy come from overseas. So there's custom delays. There's all kinds of delays in that regard. Um, and then there's just availability because plants have shut down. You know, one of our oil manufacturers shut down three of their refineries and they're only operating on one now. So it's been, so it's, it's just finding more suppliers and we're not going to go back to just focusing on one company. We're going to spread that out more. That, I think that's one of the biggest change. In a nutshell. Are you finding, can, Kurt, let me follow up to that. Are you finding more domestic suppliers? Are you, are you finding that there's more onshoring for you in terms of um, what you're doing? Wherever we can find it, we try to buy things that are made in this country. But, you know, glycol ethers and chlorinated paraffins and some other raw materials that we use, um, they only come from overseas now. We don't make we don't make some of the biocides that are used in products in this country. So it's been finding them in, you know, historically they were coming out of China, mm -hmm. um, but they're also made in Europe. So we're importing things from, from Europe through our suppliers. Um, and even though it's a little bit more expensive, it, it's helped us with, with just maintaining our supply chain because it's, I mean, you run out of raw material, you basically shut down a customer. And do you worry at all about going to more of a just-in-time um, process uh, to if there's an interruption in supply? Then what's the what's the balance of that for you in terms of just in plot, just in time versus over you know overholding on your inventory? Um, well, we've been trying to do with that because it is scary to go just in time. Because I mean, we saw it even in the automotive industry; they were out of parts, you know, because some of their their suppliers just they they shut down. And even when they tried to start up, they were still out of parts because they hadn't started up their tier ones. Mm -hmm. um, for us, it's been really working with our suppliers more. Um, they have a wealth of information. They know when things are happening way before we would ever know through just reading trade journals and, and trying to keep up with that. So um, like with an example with some of the biocides that we use, um, you know, they, they give you a heads up on when shortages are coming they know when there's going to be regulatory changes. So when that happens, we're, we buy more if we can. Um, but by having multiple suppliers and from different manufacturers, it's, it's helped balance things out, even when it's just in time. So, you know, we run into some snags on some, but for the most part, we've done okay so far. But it's, it's working with your suppliers and keeping in touch with them on a regular basis. That's really key. I respect the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, Michael, you, you had talked about, uh, when you were answering the previous question, uh, your three product lines. Uh, and you said what well, works for one system might not work for another. So as a small business, how do you, how do you gauge what system is right for the products or the inventory or the client? I think, I think some of that is um, balancing out like where uh, where the diminishing returns are. For, so it, it goes back to that kind of garbage in, garbage out principle. And I bring that up because you could have something very fancy and if uh, and has a lot of uh, outputs that, that you want to, for like executive reports and whatever. But that usually requires um, maybe, maybe more human input or checking or, or something like that, right? So if it's, if it's a lot of um, maybe similar, similar products and maybe just a few uh, different uh, vendors and things are, things are fairly automated on the manufacturing side, you know, maybe that would support a, 
ERP system, MRP system that has more bells and whistles. If you have something that's a little bit more like sort of job shop or custom, you know, and even if that, and that might take a variety of different, um, consume a variety of different materials. And sometimes that, you know, a new job consumes a new material that you're, that you're now managing, having to manage, that might not make sense um, to require your technicians or engineers or operators to input, um, you know, spend a lot of their time inputting data or something. So, so that uh, might be a simpler system. Okay, so let's just pose a question to, to both Michael and Kurt. Um, you, you guys are in B2B. Let's, let's take it to the B2C world and every, let's just use a restaurant for an example. Uh, when COVID hit and we had lockdown orders and nobody was doing anything, I know, and we all know restaurants that went to their kitchen, looked at their inventory and said, okay, I got to figure out something to do with whatever's on the shelves, right? We, we can't lose the, the asset that is there, but that only carries you through a week. So, if, if you were looking at a BSC company, how would you make that transition of, of when it comes to inventory? And to keep it specific, let's just use restaurants as an example. Any thoughts on that one? I, okay, I guess my thought is, all right, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go extreme, like large high volume manufacturing, like what I would wanna do. That would probably be completely impractical. Um, like on the, on your sauce dispenser, I want to sen I want sensors all over that thing, and when and then I want to feed sales data onto that, and then I want to understand lead times for that type of sauce. And so whenever that sauce or whatever drops to a certain level in, in that jar, I want it to trigger a PO to the vendor to automatically have that, you know, at my door with zero human request. That makes sense. So so that's that's obviously expensive right for the hardware and in the software system to execute that um yeah so that's that's an example of like the b2c but and the b and the high volume b2b okay kurt what are your thoughts i think that's why i'm not in the restaurant industry <laughs> um fair enough i'm not really sure i mean I, it would be a lot of i don't know you're trying to basically balance your your your, your raw materials with with what people are consuming um and looking for different outlets for that. Um, I mean, as far as maybe selling some of your raw materials to the to the to your consumers, as far as like selling steaks, selling burgers that aren't made yet, but the patties that you make to make your burgers, help get rid of that inventory. Um, but when you're buying it, man, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I honestly have no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm not very helpful with that one. <laughs> but I would definitely maintain an accurate inventory level of what I have, because if you don't have an accurate inventory, you're going to lose a lot. You're going to lose money. You're going to buy too much because you find things that you didn't know you had. I mean, we've done that. I bought an extra piece of equipment because I didn't know we had one. Mm. And I found it. It was like $8,000. Mm. You know, um, Kurt, you, you mentioned something about, you know, not necessarily knowing what, what the suppliers are going to be able to give you. I mean, you, you can definitely monitor and, and do with what you already have. Uh, I, I, I would venture to guess, especially in the restaurant or, or food industries, uh, that brand loyalty that, that people were relying on and you saw carry out and you saw di um, uh, delivery and Michael knows Lisa Gutierrez with Dos Hermanos taking the truck to different locations. I think that brand loyalty was able to buy some time. Uh, so you still had the demand no matter necessarily what the, what the supply was going to be. Uh, but it is a different game B2C versus, versus oh, yes. B2B on that one. So like I never understood, I never understand like the restaurant, the logistics of raw materials in the restaurant. It blows my mind because and it seems extremely stressful to me because yes. on both ends, it's really bad, right? Running out of one ingredient, right? On the spot when, when it's like an on-demand, just-in-time thing. And to the, to the other end, when you have inventory expiring, right? And you, gotta, you just got to toss out a bunch of vegetables or whatever after a week, you know? It just seems insane. Uh I, there's a, uh, a really great podcast uh, that Tim Ferriss did with, uh, I think it's Nick C C 
Kakonis, something like that. Um, he's a restaurateur in Chicago, but he actually takes a very data approach to running the restaurant. Uh, the original one that he started was Alinea, which is, you know, Michelin stars and everything like that. But he said when, when COVID hit, they went from a $500 a plate meal to a $35 volume comfort food model. And so it was a complete shift based upon kind of what you were, what you were talking about there, Michael, is, is what can we actually get? And then let's carry it through with what we're best positioned to do, which is, is cook. It just changed the, the volume and the type of cooking that they were doing. So talk, let's, let's switch over to talk a little bit about risk and how risk factors into um, how you look at your inventory um, relative to um, cash flow. So clearly inventory, you know, is a lever that we can pull from a cash flow working capital perspective. And so how do you, how do you build in risk and your risk tolerance and how does all that play into um, how you, you know, how you keep inventory and, and manage working capital? Yeah, I mean, I can, for us, I mean, as much as I keep saying we work with our suppliers and we're buying like every two weeks for production, there are some key raw materials that we can never run out of or we would be done. So for those, we've had to buy larger volumes and, and that's been painful because it does, it just sucks up cash and sits on your shelf for six months, you know? So um, it's had a negative effect. This, this, this virus has had a negative effect that way. So a lot of things we've done to increase our cash flow, to improve our cash flow, have been offset by the fact that we had to buy larger volumes of uh, different amines and, and certain base oils. Um, and some suppliers have changed the way that they will even supply them now to us, to anyone. It used to be you could buy a few totes, now you have to buy a tanker. So um, it's had some, some strains on our cash flow. Uh, when those have happened, again, though we've worked with the suppliers to see if we can get different terms. Um, where we're paying for half of it in 15 days and then the other half after, after 90 days. And, and so we got a little creative in how we pay things. And so that, that's helped us with our safety supplies. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's never ending. I mean, it's like as soon as you resolve one issue, another, another one just pops up in its place. You know? But it's fun. You know, it keeps you busy. True. So you said some suppliers are allowing, you've been able to work with some to buy in smaller quantities, but then you turn it, turn around and some suppliers are requiring you to buy in larger quantities. Yes. Um, so it's really kind of weighing it's what, a balance. what you can do with each supplier then. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're all different and they are all, I don't know, they control it. They're, they're in control right now. That's all I can say. They weren't always in control, but now they're definitely raw material suppliers are in the driver's seat at this point in the game for certain things. And Michael, what about for you in terms of risk? How do you manage that? Yeah, I think, I think um, even pre COVID, you know, I think we were pretty lean and, and just in time as much as possible. I think part of that is um, having the automotive background. Mm -hmm. Everything is just in time there pretty much. Um, and then the other part was just, you know, not having, um, you know, cash resources, right? To you just have to really be careful on on what you spend money on. Um, just natu again, naturally, uh, maybe the goal is to become you know fat and happy, like uh, <laughs> like cool and control maybe was or is. Um, but but yeah. So even now, I'd say now we've actually been able to ease up on how we were pre-COVID. And that is purely, that's purely due to um, new demand and also new financial resources, right? Um, part of that, part of that was uh, the programs from the government, but part of that was from new, new business that appeared. Yeah. Okay. So it's definitely, it's definitely nice. Now we're still trying to find that balance, but I do feel like we're a little bit more balanced than from Ex, kind of extreme mm -hmm. just in time um yeah because it didn't work all the time right we would yeah. run out of certain things and stuff so have being able to build larger margins right now 
Yeah, I heard one. I, I it was interesting. I'd heard an opinion um, from someone in the manufacturing space who said that the U.S. has become over reliant on the just in time, um, you know, philosophy, and that when you hit that supply interruption um, and any interruption, then you know if that's been your, you know, the way you've handled your um, processes, then it's really hurt you. Um, so I thought that was interesting the way you you both talked about thinking about just in time. Yeah, just in time is definitely like a false, a little bit of a misnomer. Um, yeah. Because I mean, you know, in, in automotive, as as robotic as the, that industry wants things to be, the fact is you have you're just transferring cost from the OEM to suppliers because you've got vendors parked in, in parking lots with their trailers, you know, for hours to days even, right? Mm -hmm. To try to be just in time for the OEM and not get penalized, financially penalized mm -hmm. for it. Is somebody stocking material, right? You're not, you're not popping out widgets uh, in line with, with the actual production of cars or whatever. Um, yeah, you, you're just paying the supplier to stock parts and to whatever. Yeah. Yeah. We just keep pushing it back to other people. I mean, that's really what it does. That's what JIT does. It, it mm -hmm. does. Like shit runs downhill. There it is. The suppliers are getting, you know, our mm -hmm. customers demanded of us. We demanded of our suppliers. I don't know, their suppliers demanded from somebody, probably nobody because they're, they're at the end of the line. But um, yeah, it's, JIT is a little difficult. But the nice thing about this pandemic, I guess, has been there were supply chain disruptions, but nobody was ordering. So it really was like, oh, okay, I can't buy this right now. Well, that's okay because nobody wants it. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like a um, like a factory blew up. Like we had a supplier whose factory blew up in China, and so there was a particular biocide that we nobody in the industry could buy. So there was mm. a short supply. So it was quickly reformulating products and looking at other avenues, different types of products. Um, but with the pandemic, I mean, demand went down. So even if your supply went down, it was it kind of kind of helped. Okay. So as you guys have gone through different topics, uh, in some cases, I, I feel that you have gained more power or gained more understanding or gained more leverage in being able to operate your businesses. Um, could you point to one or two areas where you feel much more confident in your ability to run uh, IC 3D or cooling control? go um <laughs> <laughs> i could go too if you don't want to but you go first all go right for it. so i mean some places where we've made improvements to to our to our system that if that's really going to carry through and has helped us is really is breaking down our inventory more um we used to look at inventory by raw material and finished goods and one of the things that we found looking at turnover rate um has been and we've always kind of seen this but we never really did much about it was that you know, we buy things in bulk and that has a certain, you know, you buy bulk and, you know, you know you're not going to use bulk all in one day. It's going to be used over time. So it had a lower, you know, a lower turnover rate. We buy some materials in drums. They turn over in like a day, whereas others turned over um, over the course of a year because they're catalysts or something for a reaction. And um, so we segmented our inventory from just being one giant bucket into multiple subcategories. And by looking at those, we were able to more effectively find issues with certain products, you know, as far as turnover rates. And it was it enabled us to really consolidate some raw materials. Uh, we found some that just, they don't turn over, you know, but they were critical to one product that we make. So we were able to find some other raw material that we're buying to, to break that down. And, 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 and basically it helped our cash flow because now I'm buying one raw material versus two that had the same functionality. Um, so by breaking it down into subgroups, we've been able to improve our turnover, which in turn improved our cash flow. We had less tied up in inventory. Um, I think for us, the, the relationships with the vendors, the primary vendors, and the amount of stock and, and, and lead times have um, not, not changed so drastically to where we're, we're having to make a lot of changes in-house. Um, again, going back to the, to the uh, you know, thankfully getting more financial resources and being able to really use 
um, you know, our systems like we're supposed to, MRP systems, mm -hmm. um, and be able to have, uh, you know, comfortable lead times or, or comfortable min stock and uh, buffers for things like that. Um, that's, that's been the biggest, that's been the biggest change. And, and again, a lot of that was, a lot of that was COVID related, like new business, increased business. Um, but some of that was happened, started happening pre COVID. Yeah. And I, I don't would, know if I your question. Um, yeah. I think that, yeah, I think that answered it, Michael. Okay. I want to <laughs> open it up too. I know that um, we've got about, you know, 15 minutes left and we certainly want to open it up to any questions. And John put that in the chat. I, I think a couple of people had to drop off. Um, but I do know, and I'm not, uh, I'll call you out, Brian Collins from Forward Technologies, who's who I see on the call with us as well uh, from a manufacturing standpoint. And Brian, what, maybe you can share your perspective as owning a machine shop um, maybe you could share with us a little bit about what pre and post COVID has looked like. I know you and I had some conversation on um, certainly more onshoring in the industry and, and some things that were um, being done in Italy got shut down and um, then you were asked to produce. And um, so would you share with us a little bit about that? Sure. How y'all doing? Um, yeah, it's been, it's been, different it's been difficult and it's been fun um, things are changing all the time um, with the, the the stuff from from Europe um, it turned out that that really didn't come into into production because the, the auto plant in this country that needed it was shut down mm -hmm. so they lost their supplier in, in, uh, in Italy in the meantime, they were trying to find somebody that could produce the parts. They found us, they started shipping the material. While the material's in shipment, uh, they came and they said, well, we're shutting down the, the turbocharger plant, so we really don't need the parts. So they, they went back to Italy and that's fine. We're seeing the same type of work coming in, but the, the, the pre-COVID, we had larger volumes at, at per PO and uh, during COVID and now to this phase that we're in now, the uh, the volumes are, are lower, but they're ordering faster. So you're getting more turns with lower volume. So it's it's driving up our costs. We're having more setup time. And it's downtime, so that has to be absorbed. Uh, nobody wants to pay any more money for it. So that's it's challenging. And um, it's, it, it's definitely interesting. Uh, my partner here, is, <clears throat> they've, uh, they've done some different things with inventory. They, it used to be just a big, huge group of stuff. And now it's broke down to consumables, you know, consumable tooling and things like that. And we've set up where we don't pay for it until the operator actually pulls it out of a vending machine. So that's really helped our cash flow a lot in that respect. Um, we're managing customer supplied material one way and our material a different way where the customer supplied material will come in and it might sit here for a few weeks till we can get into the machine where the stuff that we're paying for, I mean, that's our money. So Brad's having it delivered the day we need to put it into the machine. <clears throat> so we've kind of forced that down onto our supplier on raw, raw material suppliers. But, that's the only people we can really push it down to. So I feel kind of left out. <laughs> well, thank you. I know you and I've had a lot of conversation about that as well. And so as you've managed, how have you managed, you guys have managed risk? <clears throat> uh, we deal with it every day because every, 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 everything that comes up is slightly different. And uh, that's the way we grew the company and that's the way you know, we can't just say, okay, this goes into this pigeonhole. We look for the best solution for that particular set of problems or opportunities. And I guess for all of you, my question would be, are you, um, are you optimistic from what you're seeing right now about um, the future and manufacturing in the U.S. and where their opportunities are, even given this, you know, up and down that we're going through currently? 
Yeah, I mean, I am. You have to be. I mean, otherwise you wouldn't be in business if you didn't maintain some level of optimism to what's happening in the economy. Um, I mean, our sales were at, you know, about 70% down in April. In May, they were like 50 or something. Now they're, now we're at like, I think, 65 or 70% of where we should be. Um, so it's getting better every month. July is looking even better than June. Um, so I think things will eventually get back to normal. Um, and in that time, you, you take advantage of other opportunities, which we've done. We've branched out into other, um, you know, focusing less on automotive and more on medical, um, more on, um, on I can't even think, consumer goods as far as like appliances, even though that's kind of down too. There's really not a lot of people buying washers and dryers apparently. But, um, and then just different avenues of, of different types of fluids for us. Um, so I think, you know, the future will be better. Uh, we're going to be more streamlined for sure, which will help us uh, as far as different different processes that we put in place for receiving and for purchasing, um, even just for manufacturing, um, just to streamline how things are made and how batches are made. So I think it'll get better and it will be better and we'll be better because of it. Great. Michael, what about you? Yeah, I'd say um, pretty optimistic right now. Um, I guess the, the different fronts are, um, you know, the industry of additive manufacturing uh, is, is pretty pretty much going to, I think, going to keep increasing for the foreseeable future, at least a decade, I believe. Um, so, that's, yeah, that's one. And it's, we're not just serving automotive. Again, we're trying to get a, a broader, um, we have a fairly broad array of customers and industries. Um, then the kind of the second trend, I'd say, is the, the reshoring um, kind of initiatives out there, including from, yeah, big, big pushes for that for, from politicians. The natural um, reshoring kind of mentality for that, that kind of um, grew from this pandemic, right? The realization mm -hmm. that, hey, you know what? There are, some, there are some basic PPE things that are not really made in our country. Right. Like, so, so like if, you know, if only two countries that are not in the U S are making nitrile gloves, that's, that's probably, you know, that's probably a, a concern. Right. Mm -hmm. The third, the third kind of thing that um, COVID brought up was that the additive manufacturing industry, you know, 3d printing something is, is a legitimate manufacturing um, option. Uh, whether it's primary ma primary manufacturing method or bridge manufacturing, right? Um, a lot of, a lot of the world has now seen uh, the the role that three D printing has played, right? No longer you know widgets and trinkets and Yoda heads, but actual things. You know, in the first couple months, we from very very quickly, like within one week days, you know, we produced we were. Uh, on the way to producing, you know, 10,000 face shields over the, over the course of a, a couple of months. And then over that time, you, you gather information, you, you finalize the design, and then you kick off tooling for injection molding. And then, and then we were working on 100,000, mm -hmm. right? So in that case, additive manufacturing was bridge manufacturing, but played equally uh, the same role um, as injection molding. Uh, then, then third, we luckily, in the middle of all the madness, we were able to get a an army grant um, for kind of what we were doing before. It was like a phase two award, and so that was a, a pretty nice, um, sizable amount. That's going to be about a two year burn. So it's it's going to be it's going to be comfortable. It's going to uh, let us let us do a lot more and definitely keep going. Mm -hmm. So yeah, optimism all around. Optimism right. all around. That's what we should have titled today's episode, Optimism <laughs> All Around. Um, so to, to wrap us up, you know, we, we introduced today really focusing uh, and, and just setting the stage when it came to retail, the, the decisions that are impacting that industry. We've been through all different types of manufacturing. We've talked B2B, B2C. Uh, I even threw a food question in there for to, to throw you guys off. Um, but 
and I would ask Audra if, if she heard the same thing I did. I, I heard confidence and power and decision making coming from all three business owners that we heard here today. Uh, we can't necessarily control what is being thrown at us, uh, but we can get better at what we do in what Kurt said, right? Managing the, the, the supply chain inside of our own uh, warehouse, inside of our own operations. We can pivot uh, as, as Michael talked about and find different uses uh, for what we do. Uh, so I, I really, as a, as a small business diehard, I can appreciate that optimism. I can appreciate the, the power that, that we display in ourselves to make decisions that have a, a big impact. Uh, so for, to Kurt, I would say thank you very much for, for, for sharing uh, your stories about Cool and Control. Uh, to Michael, I would say thank you for kind of uh, letting us in a little bit to see what you do uh, with IC3D. And uh, I, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Anytime.